In this series, I'm speaking to musicians from Manchester. For this episode, I spoke to DJ and producer Monge2. Since performing at Part Life in 2022, he's put out a steady stream of creative projects. I really enjoyed hearing his perspective on the music industry and how he stays committed while still having fun. Side podcast. Yeah. Um, I want to start by saying Park Life. Yeah. That's where I first came across you, I think. Okay. Because I looked at the old lineup from last year's Park Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because I was on the search for interesting people. Right. And that's kind of how I came across your stuff. That's cool. I was wondering if it would, if that would work like that. You know, because it's quite, quite about a really big festival, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, I was hoping that something would come from being on that lineup. You know. So I'm glad you found me, man. So you were on the VIP. What was it called? The VIP. Yeah, the VIP stage uh, on the first day. So I opened up the festival essentially. Mm. Um, I was on at like 11 a.m., which was quite a strange set because. It's 11 a.m., but it's park life. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you're trying to bridge that sort of gap between it being the morning when people start having breakfast and it being, you know, a big festival like that. Were people already on it? Uh, I'd say so. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I rarely crack a beer at 11 a.m., but I did that day. Yeah. Um, festival rules. It doesn't apply. Doesn't yeah, it? you know, when when in uh, when in Heaton Park. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really cool, man. It was quite an experience. I've never done anything like that on that scale. Because um, you haven't been gigging for that long, have you, under the current... Not days? as much, too, no. Um, before that, I'd probably only done f- three or four gigs. Um, so pretty much thrown in. And then, yeah, obviously since then, I've done, done quite a few more. But, um, yeah, it felt like I was sort of pushed into it and you know by fire yeah and it went really well it really did I uh, met a lot of good people there um, and yeah I want to go again this year lineup's amazing but I've been seeing that big billboard they've got plastered by the main road yeah yeah it's cool it just seems to be getting bigger and better every year which is really good to see because um, they're, they're, they're a group of people that really like love what they do do you know what I mean and they care it's got a really good reputation as a festival, I have to say. Yeah. I've never me. actually been myself because yeah. I'm not that local to Manchester until recently. But. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, musically, it's <laughs> there's not much that comes close to it, to be honest, around here. Um, even for, for the UK as a whole, to, you know, forget regional. Um, yeah, it's, it's smashing it. And so for you to get to that stage, literally that stage, yeah. so early on, yeah. that's that's a hell of an achievement. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, it felt it. It was a bit bit sweet for me, because yeah, I, you know, I appreciate what you say, but I felt like, although I've been doing music for years and gigging with bands and stuff like that, it was like, that should be something that that comes, you know, after a couple of years graft, and then you finally get that opportunity, and and for me, like I say, I only did like three or four gigs before it. I'd only been doing the Monge Two thing since like the January. And then that was in the June, so, you know, it's not long. And although I was like, you know, I was aware that I must be doing something right for someone to want to book me for something like that. I was also like, you know, I, I don't know, there's a lot There's a lot of other people that, that have been grafting mm. and, and they haven't got it. And, I'm, and, I, and I shouldn't really think like that because I, I should just do me. But, you know, it yeah, it was a strange feeling. I suppose it, it's such a potluck, isn't it? Like success, like yeah, big it, time. I think the best way you can see it is if you happen to strike lucky. Yeah, just think, okay, I'll send help for the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. know once I've quote unquote made it. Yeah, well <laughs> maybe. Um, I've got nothing on that scale this year, so might have to be uh, might have to wait a little bit longer to be Pied Piper. But um, <laughs> yeah, I would like to do if if things did progress. You know, I'd definitely. There's a lot of artists, a lot of DJs doing amazing stuff. And um, I feel like you've got to make a little community and help each other out. Yeah. Because, like you say, opportunities are hard to come by. And a lot of it is down to luck, but a lot of it is down to the hard work as well. So, 
half half the battle you can definitely do yourself you can put in the work but the other half you just got to sort of be in the right place at the right time or come up in a conversation or be noticed on a lineup yeah you know just by someone being sort of observant and taking a taking a notice to you Whereas the more you put yourself out there, the more you're maximising those chances, aren't you? Yeah, that's it. So the more you put in, the more chances you're going to have these lucky situations, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah, that plays into the hard work thing again, I guess, yeah. And then, the, as I started to look into you more and more, I found that, uh, I think, was it on your Instagram bio, the 40-minute uh, or 30-odd minute set that you've done? Uh, was it in Pirate? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I did it, recorded it in Pirate. Um, I, I recorded that one purely to try and get some more work. Mm. Um, so I I spent a lot of time sort of creating that set and making sure you know the tracks were working well together and I did it at Pirate because I don't really have much gear because it's so expensive yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean so I've got a little um, little track to set up which does the job do you know what I mean I can I can do gigs with it if I need to and I can practice and, and make sure I know what, what's what but I felt for that I just needed to get in there, use the pioneers. Um, I'm saving up to get them, but yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of money, man. Yeah. So, yeah, especially with everything else at the moment, it's tough. It's not like being a singer songwriter, acoustic well, guitarist. Where yeah, like... yeah. Well, my other loves, um, you know, producing music. So if I ever get a bit of money, I tend to just have a little bash at buying something new or yeah, a new piece of equipment. Because what I really like about a lot of your stuff is, based on what I've seen from the track breakdowns, there's a lot of analog instruments in there, isn't there? It's not just like you don't just program in a bass line. You've actually yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, you, you, you play in the bass, isn't it? And it's got yeah, the... um, yeah. I love I love the way that you can manipulate sounds on an analog, you know, synth. Or I've got an electronic drum kit which I play stuff in, and sometimes I might have to take samples from you know drum drum pads and stuff like that, and then put them in. Um, just because they sound a lot better and I'm like I could play I could put in the track what I've recorded which sounds half decent or I can get something playing the rhythm that I've played in but then sample it with something that sounds amazing do you know what I mean yeah. so it's like why go, why why settle yeah although you get something else you know what I mean I, so I yeah I, I try and make it sound as good as possible but have fun along the way that um, was it the Smokey Robinson song yeah, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, that was the first. So I, I did like a little series of putting reels together. Yeah, just like minute reels, um, which was strange because it was the first time I started to write music or arrange it at least in the mind of of it being a minute song. Do you know what I mean? Which mm. is quite strange. Is that where we've come to in music, where you know people's attention span will only be sufficed for you to write a song of, of 60 seconds in length mm. do you know what I mean it's like it's a far cry from the 17 minute prog rock songs well, in yeah, the 70s in it. but even like because stylistically the music I write it could it could be like 7-8 minutes long you know mm. um, a lot of the music I listen to is that long but yeah we've got to this point but it works man so it's, the, it's at the moment it's the best way to get your music out there mm. you know doing these TikTok reels and, and Instagram um, and, it, and it just shows a little bit of what you're about and how you know like I make how I make my music you know which and seeing the way that because on that video you're like adding each layer in aren't you as it's going yeah. it's looping the song it does add an extra layer of appreciation yeah. rather than just hearing the finished product you can actually yeah. see how much thought's gone into each individual track because I like watching them I like seeing you know how producers that I'm into yeah. do it yeah. and when they put little things like that together it just really like grabs you mm. for me anyway because I'm a bit of a music geek do you know what I mean but I think you know most people enjoy music don't they so I think, uh, yeah, everyone can get something out of it, hopefully. It's like, you know, the have you ever seen those Rick Beato? Rick Beato, I think his name is. I'm uh, not, no. He does this series where what he's managed to do, because he's a producer, he's got uh, various contacts and so on, so he can get hold of the original stems from all these like really, really massive tracks. Okay. And he'll listen to them and he'll break down. You'll, for example, it'll take, like, I don't know, pick an example, Foo Fighters Everlong. Yeah. And you're listening to the song obviously you know you can hear the stuff that you know is in there there's the guitar there's the drums blah blah blah, blah yeah, yeah. vocals but then there's all these backing vocals that you 
when you listen to the song back you realise that they are in there and they are adding something yeah but you wouldn't consciously know that they're there yeah so you kind of come away from, with an extra layer of respect for the song yeah yeah you can see how much production's gone into it right. to actually make it like 0.1% better yeah, yeah is that um, is that a YouTube channel is it yeah it's just a guy on YouTube what's his name Rick Rick Beato Rick like Beato. Beat but with them with an O at the end ah I see I'll check that out that sounds interesting just, I think he does all sorts of genres, but he, he seems to focusly, focus mostly on rock. Yeah. But he's kind of branching out a little bit, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. Mm. Sounds cool. I'm, yeah, I'm always interested. So he gets the stems? He, I think he manages to get hold of the original stems. Sometimes he, just, he, has like, he runs into copyright issues, so he can't play yeah. it, but he'll play along with it. Uh, uh, you know, because obviously yeah. YouTube's red hot on copyright. Yeah, I don't know how I managed to put my mixers on, to be honest. Never get any issues. Mm. But, you know... I'll keep quiet on that one actually yeah <laughs> <laughs> I get flagged because I like to start each episode with the artist's song yeah you know like um, like 30 seconds from the from the guest yeah and then YouTube's like ah 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 is that if you monetize it though I think so I, I seem to be getting a lot of warnings but not actual right. action because yeah I'm not I, I don't monetize anything so maybe that's why I don't know maybe loopholes yeah God knows you need him in the music industry. Yeah, but well, he needs money as well, so... There's that. Yeah. What's kind of the long-term goal, then? Um, the long-term goal is unknown. I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I think it's this. I don't know. I've been doing it for years, man, so... Um, yeah, I suppose... I'm, I've just, like... I've fallen in love with it again. Like, I have these moments where I have a bit of a... Not a not a not a drop in it, but my excitement can be diminished at certain times, mm. and then I become overly self-critical. But at the moment, I'm having this sort of period of of uh, yeah, like euphoria for it again, which is really joyful. So um, I think as long as I keep having these cycles, these dips, these ebb and flows, you know, yeah, I don't know if it'll ever ever end. So. And I think the music I'm writing is getting better, and I'm getting yeah, it just seems to be getting stronger in a lot of different avenues. So yeah, I don't know. I don't. I used to have like real, um, like dead set goals where I wanted to be. Mm. That didn't happen by a certain age, and then I started to beat myself up for that. So I think as I've got older, I'm like. I'm letting that go a bit more and I'm letting, I'm letting myself have a bit more fun with music not taking it so seriously yeah. but still trying to make things sound as good as they can be you know just because you're not taking it seriously doesn't mean that it's got to be you know it's got to suffer in any way or you know you've got to compromise you can still make things sound really good and do things to the best of your ability but just have a bit of fun with it at the same yeah. time and since I've done that it's yeah it's it's like it's like I've started again. Do you know what I mean? I'm like the pressure's off. Yeah, it's great. It's really I'm having so much fun with it at the moment, working with loads of different people, which is relatively new to me as a solo artist. Doing collabs was something that I was a bit hesitant to do. I'd, I'd just like to work in my own space, but yeah, recently I've been doing that, so that's really exciting. Because you just end up sort of coming out with something you never you never thought you'd do on your own. You know, mm -hmm. although. Elements of it are obviously you playing it, but it just seems to go in a different direction, which is really exciting. You don't really know where it's going to go, and you both feed off each other's energy. So, yeah, it's really good. Um, got a few a few gigs coming up, um, and I've got I've got a first release coming out on a label actually, which is really exciting. Oh, wow. Which I haven't really announced yet. Um, so yeah, but it's. Um, yeah, it should be should be out in the in the next couple of months. That's exciting. Yeah, it is, man. It is because like working with a label was something that I've wanted to do since you know I started really. Yeah, it's a big badge um, of honor, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, have that backing. Yeah, definitely. It it it's, it certifies your place in in music. You know what I mean? If people are willing to invest time and money into you and what you do then you're doing something right aren't you yeah because sometimes you can do gigs and 
some you don't know why they yeah they could have just booked you because you know I don't know there's there's numerous reasons but when you know a label want to work with you there's no other explanation for that is there rather than they think that you're doing something the only new. possible incentive for them is that exactly so it means a lot more and the me yeah it's a super cool like electronic label for Manchester um, and uh, the caliber of the music that they put out is absolutely like yeah amazing so to be thought of and considered in the same light as what they've already put out yeah pretty pretty overwhelmed with that to be honest yeah so yeah I'm looking forward to getting that out and then who knows from there you know once you've got that backing behind you other eyes might come on to you and then yeah I don't know I hold no sort of uh, no aspirations really but just to make music and just see you know see how far it goes I always thought that I thought when I was a bit younger I was like if I don't give it everything I've got now I'm going to sit in my rocking chair when I'm 70 and think yeah I should have gone for that a bit more yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean and that 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 regret would be real like, you know most other things you can sort of let pass but when it's something that you're deeply passionate about and you know you've got you know a real love for it and people appreciate it and and you still slacked off a bit you know it, it, it could it could eat you up later on in life so with that I yeah I did absolutely hound it for like three four years uh, which I I don't regret it I don't regret that but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great for me like in the end mentally yeah burn out big time mm. and then my relationships were sort of um, slightly strained and that was never good that's not good for me that's not good for other people so now I've got a bit of a balance where you know I make music when I want and, and, and only then and then I can spend time with people and yeah. doing other things getting out going for a walk without that thing in the back of my head going but you could be doing this couldn't mm. you? Why, are you why are you here why are you with these people mm. and then I, it takes me out at the moment you know it takes me out of the enjoyment of being with friends and family and that's not good you know you, you, you can't you can't live like that so now it's, everything feels a little bit more balanced and subsequently it's uh, yeah I think I think everything's paying off I suppose your first and most important piece of gear is your own mind your own mindset yeah so it, you're flogging that and it's yeah straining yeah definitely how are you going to come up with something creative or yeah you know, you're not going to but then you know I did because this is a relatively new concept to me like the power of the mind I, I, I used to sort of undermine it a bit or not really you know be aware of its power it, you know obviously it was but like I mean in day to day life mm with how you perceive and approach situations. I just used to think that it, the way it was was the way it was because that's how it is. But it's not and it doesn't have to be like that. And yeah, with music, um, since I've sort of changed my perspective on my creative process and towards my life, yeah, it just seems it just seems so much so much clearer, so much more fun, energised. I think as I'm having that space and break in between everything. Yeah. Um, and then I'm coming back eager rather than just being like you know nine hours sat down drilling a track every day yeah you know, it's not it's not it's not it's not a bad thing but it's not a good thing I don't think works for some people maybe I don't know but yeah for me at the moment I just take a step back every now and again do you know what I mean yeah it's always interesting to sit down and talk with artists because some some artists seem to be able to say I'm not in the mood to write this. My dog just died. Whatever. Yeah. But they'll sit down and they'll just keep hammering away, finding chord combinations or what have you until they put yeah. them in. And then other artists, and I think this is becoming more common, seem to be a bit more go with the flow. Yeah. Like they'll say, "No, nothing's coming today. I'm not even. I'm not going to try and force this." I'm yeah. Just gonna... Yeah. Um, that I think that's yeah a, a very good point. I'm still like I do get frustrated sometimes because it's still a learning curve do you know what I mean but I'm trying to get better at just accepting when things you know aren't really flowing yeah. and allowing it and then when it's not working it's like it's fine do you know what I mean and, and, and let it roll and then come back to it another day you know but there's still that little 
bit in the back of your head which is like you know you, you go into a session and you want to write something good like naturally you don't want to go in there and write something that's rubbish yeah so naturally already that that bar that for that pressure is there you know what I mean that lid's a bit like ready to blow almost yeah um, so you gotta just sort of yeah take a step back um, I just like just become aware of your surroundings and all that and just just try and just sit with it you know rather than just battling it in your head just sit there man just sit there and just play just play one thing that someone told me on another podcast actually which really that was quite yeah it was quite a, a game changer for me so he, he he had this analogy of um the creative process to uh, he likened it to when he was a kid and you had a box of lego and you poured out that box of lego and you didn't know what you were going to make but you just made things anyway and you just you just put bricks on bricks and just 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 to see what would become yeah and to take that concept and apply it to the creative process it's it, honestly like that it takes the pressure away for a start because you get into that sort of childlike state of play and yeah you just there's just this freedom within it you know where you've got no you've got no end game and you just lay things up you just put a little beat down put a little bass put up put a little synth on might not sound great but you're just playing around and then eventually something will come do you know yeah Nine times out of ten, anyway. Um, so yeah, little little things like that, little mind sort of techniques, you know. It really like it is a powerful tool. It can be the best and worst thing, you know, if you're not using it right. Because you can start to stack on this pressure, and it become you become yeah. your own worst enemy, don't you? Where you and I think now with social media as well, how you're seeing all these other artists, you yeah. know, doing amazing things potentially. Um, and you think, why, why am I not doing that? You know, why, why, why did I not get booked for that again? Mm. Why, why am I not getting shared? Why did they share their track? Mm. And you're thinking in your head, you know. And I suppose that come, that's like it's, it's semi-natural because, as a species, we, you know, we want to be accepted and loved by a community, mm. whether that's a musical community or just you know your extended friends and whatever. Um, so it's sort of an innate part of us. So to try and escape that is really hard. But I think just well for me anyway, I just try and I try and limit the amount of time. Like I'm on my phone. If I'm mm. in the studio making music, it's in the other room. Do you know what I mean? And then just but as soon as it's out out the room, it just you're just not thinking about it. Do you know what I mean? But if it's there, you're just clicking on it, and you know, or so you get a notification. Really distracting stuff. And you're trying to write music. Um, for more reasons than one. So yeah, that that doesn't help for this day and age because I suppose you know twenty even ten years ago, you wouldn't you wouldn't have had that, but you still had that that element of compare, wouldn't you? I think, like I say, it's being hyper aware of how many likes or how yeah, many no, retweets that your colleagues or your peers are getting. It has it has definitely turned into that hyper state, but yeah, just try I try and take a bit of space from that. Because it will eat you up eventually. Yeah. It's counterproductive. Yeah, hundred percent. But unfortunately, you need it, don't you? You got to put it on social media. I've done it. I've looked at it for this podcast. Yeah, a similar podcast that somebody's doing on the other side of the world. Yeah, in a di- totally different city. And I'll go. Hmm. Let's see. By their fifth episode, they had this many likes. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm like, what am I doing? Why yeah. am I thinking like that? That's. <laughs> yeah. Am I trying to win? Am I trying to beat them? Well, maybe. But I don't know. Strange. I, yeah, I don't think we really know why. Like, it won't change. Mm. The only thing you're going to change from doing that is reducing your output. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're not gonna. You're not gonna excel doing doing stuff like that. Sit there scrolling. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, like it's count, counterproductive, counterintuitive. Nothing positive. No. But. Yeah, creatives need it. If it wasn't for music, I wouldn't even have a smartphone. I'm just mm. it's it, it's it's a great tool to get gigs and promote music, of course. But if I had the choice, I would definitely get it going. Like, I had a friend who lost one, and then he couldn't didn't get round to getting one for a week. Yeah, and then he said, "You know what? I'm cleansed." 
Yeah. And he didn't get one for about six months until he needed it for like, you know, family reasons or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And even then he, he didn't go with a smartphone. <clears throat> well, I didn't. I, I did abstain for a good few years. But then when the music started to pick up, and I was getting like the having an email and stuff yeah. like that, like quickly and get back to people. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna have to get get a smartphone. But yeah, I managed to managed to stay without one for a good few years. Probably only probably only about three three four years ago, I got a smartphone. Yeah, so I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, but everyone used to take the mick out of me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, you're just like too indie, man. I'm like, <laughs> no, I just can't be asked with it. Look at you on it. Everyone's on it, and I am now. Yeah. It's hooked me. Do you know what I mean? It has. Nothing. Reluctantly. Yeah, no, big time. But it's just got a power, because it's that like you know you get a like. It's that. It's that. It feeds into that. That party that wants to be accepted, and you get mm -hmm. that little dopamine hit, and yeah. it's like, oh, give me some more, man. Give me some dopamine. Yeah, it's too easy, but, isn't it? But, yeah, it's... Um, they should come with warning labels, like cigarettes. Well, I think we're now waking up to it a bit more, aren't we? Like, the dangers of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, is it as bad as smoking? I don't know. What about if you're smoking and scrolling? Yeah. Dead in ten years, mate. <laughs> That's your mental and physical health going. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, fair dues. They used to think tobacco was the cure for all sorts. Yeah. You know, oh, you got asthma? Right, here's a pack of Benson and Hedges. Yeah. Well, I wonder if we're going to start seeing mobile phones the same way. Yeah, I don't, well, to be fair, maybe, because, like, when, you know, when you feel anxious or you're in an awkward situation, a lot of people reach for their phones. Mm. So it could be like, oh, you're feeling anxious in social situations. You know, have a, have an upgrade. Yeah. When you're waiting for someone at a restaurant or a cafe or when you're at a party and like yeah. your group's wandered away from you, it's a phone. Yeah, it is, it is. And I try not to, but sometimes it's all subconscious, isn't it? Mm. You're not even, and then five minutes into, into a scroll, you know, you're like, well, how, you know, it just happens. Um, but, you know, this is just the beginning as well. Like really, social media taking a really yeah. like, strong hold over people. So, yeah, who knows where it'll be in 10 years, man. I suppose as a creator, you've got to find a way to take the best of it because it's not going away yeah. without letting it seep into your life in a negative way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely positives as well because just having, like, the ability to, you know, research stuff on the fly and, mm. you know, look stuff up. I, when I'm writing songs, Rhyme Zone... Really helpful. What's Rhyme Zone? So Rhyme Zone's a little, um, I suppose it's, it's like a, a big theosaurus and you put in whatever word you want to rhyme mm. with and then it'll come up with, you know, everything that does possibly rhyme with that word or even near rhymes or um, like a few other options as well. But if you're in a bit of a rut writing, it can be really helpful. Well, it's cool because like you can have you can have a, like the sound of a word in your head when you're writing a song, and then you go, well, it sounds like circle, but I don't want circle. So you put in circle, and then it comes up with you know purple or you know whatever else turtle. There's not many rhyme, uh, rhymes for circle actually, but for example, you know it can just change it can change the the way that the song is being written. You know right. Change the trajectory of it. Yeah, completely. Um, give you new ideas. And although it might only give you the word you want to end that phrase with, you know, you still got to be creative in how you piece all the other words together and make it into one yeah. sort of, you know, cohesive piece. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to use stuff like that. Um, and, like, obviously, you get a lot of new music through Spotify, so that's a good, good yeah. positive from it. Although they're not, obviously, they're a little bit of the devil in disguise. Well, I don't even know if they're in disguise anymore. Um, but, yeah, so pros and cons. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, they're here to stay, aren't they? Yeah, just got to work with it. Yeah, rather than yeah, that's it, mate. I really like the um, scrolling back through your... Um, previous stuff I really like the video that you put out for your first single oh yeah 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 that's was it entirely DIY just you yeah so I um, yeah I had a, I got a little DSLR camera and a stand 
and I had nothing to do all day. <laughs> so I thought, let's make a video. And, you know, it was a little bit um, elongated because I had to sort of get the set, the scene right, you know, frame yeah. it right, get into shot. Is it okay? Go back, watch it. No, I'm going to sit there instead of there. Little things like that. So you were up and down, literally. Yeah. Operating the camera and then yeah. jumping into the set. Yeah, it was pretty heavy duty, but I did love it. And I, and I haven't really done it since like that. But yeah, it was because it was, it was quite labor intensive. Yeah. Is it um, just in the one day, was it? Yeah, I just did it all in a day. That's pretty good going. Yeah, all in my front room. Um, just move things in and out of, you know, mm. little, some little set designs and stuff. Did you get the camera swinging at some point, or was was there some kind of motion effect going on? Um, that yeah, that was accidental, really. <laughs> so um, no, I'm on about a different part. I th the camera like fell over, right? So I like put it in, um, but I think yeah, there's like a motion. But if you if you zoom in, this is in the editing, right? So I zoomed in, and then play with like the parameters a bit. So it gives it the camera a bit of a wobble. Yeah, it's got like a sway effect. Yeah. Um, just to make it a little bit more natural, because obviously if it's just on a stand for every shot, yeah, everything's yeah. a little static, isn't it? So yeah, just had a bit of a bit of a bit of a play around with with parameters and stuff. And I think it just came out a little bit more naturally, and then I sort of made the camera sort of pan a bit, you know, if you zoom it in a lot, little things like that. Mm. Um, but I got inspired for that through um, Bo Burnham's film that he put out in lockdown. Oh, yeah. What was that called again? Uh, I can't remember, you know. It's like a one-word title. Yeah, one something. word, yeah. I can't remember, but I, I watched that. That was the first thing I ever watched. Oh, my friend put me onto it. And he said, oh, you should watch this film. There's this guy uh, just in his bedroom. Yeah. I was like, mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might watch that one. Um, but I thought, you know what, there's that film. And then I put it on and um, yeah, it pretty much blew my mind. It was like, wow, like the capabilities of what's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being on your own. Because some people, when they have to make a low budget one person video, they like ham it up and they deliberately make it as like amateur looking as possible. Yeah. You know, to give it a certain charm. Yeah. You know, there's a place for that. That is so burning. No, no, yeah. No, no that, that didn't happen with that film. And um, in your case as well, if you told me that you'd hired like a team really? to make that, I would have believed you. Wow. Well, I would have said money well spent. Yeah. Wow, that's quite a compliment. So you did all the like post production as well with the camera. Yeah, yeah, did it all. Yeah. The footage. yeah. Um I la yeah, I absolutely loved it. It's like one of those little loves that I've got that I don't really do as much as I want to. Mm -hmm. Just because I don't really get out there and film stuff. But I love the idea of eventually getting I wanna make some like ambient soundscapes and make some make some um, put some footage together mm. and yeah I like the idea of doing something like that because um, yeah I definitely I definitely do love doing this sort of whole film aspect as yeah. well uh, but that's why I did those little reels so I, well to be fair I started with the reels where I shot them a little bit like that video um, you know with a stand getting the shots right and then they were, there was a bit of traction. It wasn't loads for the amount of effort I was putting in. I know it was early days, but then I just put one up just on, on the fly, you know, just it was just one shot. Just filmed it on my phone, didn't even use the DSLR. Mm. And then I put that up and it got like better than all, the, it got more traction than all the others combined. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it was like, I'm putting in all that effort. And people, I, you know, most people aren't that arsed. Mm. So maybe just make life easy for yourself, and you just put up a little, a little minute of just one shot. You're just playing what you're playing, and so I've been doing that since really, um, and it saved me a bit on uh, Premiere Pro as well. So uh, yeah, because you know, <laughs> it is expensive. But yeah, so yeah, maybe I might make another video though. But it might be difficult because it feels like that idea has been done now where it was possible to do that one you know work on work on my own mm. in my front room playing different instruments and different you know doing different things eating bananas uh, whereas if I was to do it on my own again you know with, with a different concept that's not really possible is it it only really worked for that idea mm. 
So maybe I might have to get people, but I, that's I think I because I got to a point because I, like I said I was in bands for years. I got to a point where I just I was sick of waiting around for people. Do you know what I mean? Relying on other people for stuff. So the whole idea of the Monge Two at the start was just completely DIY. Record it all, mix it all, master it all, mm. do the video, do the artwork, distribute it, the whole shebang. You know, just did it all myself. If you want something done right. Yeah, completely, yeah. Do it yourself. Um, and I was really happy with the outcome of that, you know, that first sort of test of it. Um, but then sometimes you got to reach out because um, I'm not great at everything, do you know what I mean? Um, and I know that if I do outsource certain elements like mastering, if I if I outsource that, I definitely get a better, better mm. outcome. Um, so yeah, I'm just having to uh, grit my teeth on that one. Do you know what I mean? Mastering's a dark art. Yeah, I don't really. I don't, it feels like I'm doing everything right, and it sounds, you know, volume wise and and dynamics, everything's sitting right and all that. And then yeah, you just I sent. So I used this guy in Germany. Um. And he just, I don't know what he does. I know he's got a lot of like outboard hardware stuff and that. Mm. And it is, you know, obviously he's in like, you know, a multi thousand pound studio. I don't, it might even be a million. I don't know. It's fancy. You know what I mean? And I'm just doing plugins in a little box room in Salford. <clears throat> and yeah, so it's um, not quite as close. And I, I, yeah, I don't know what he does, but it's worth the money. Um, really good so with my next well not the next release because that's going to be through the label but I'm doing a couple of other projects at the moment with um, with some pals and fellow musicians um, just the collaborations that you were talking yeah about. so they're, but they're, they're, they're going really well so I'm gonna, yeah I'm gonna gonna get them mastered properly I'm gonna outsource that and are you going to release them as like a one compilation album or are you going to... I don't know what to do with them because obviously a lot of other people have been involved and in um, stylistically, they're not a million miles away from what I put out anyway. Mm. Um, but I don't know whether they, they're their own entities, do you know mm. what I mean? I haven't made my mind up yet. You think it would be too jarring if they were all in one? Well, yeah, and I think the way that it's going, I think... I want to work with these people more, you know what I mean? Mm. So in that respect, it might be worth trying to think, is this a side project, you know, completely right. different to the Monge 2? And the Monge 2 stuff, I can sort of focus on my DJing with it and mm. have it as a little bit of a output for that. And then, you know, stuff that I feel personally connected to musically. Mm. Maybe it's an outlet for that sort of music, whereas the other stuff that I'm collaborating with, there's, there's, this is it's, it's a little bit more fun and a little bit more sort of, yeah, I don't know, it's different. So, yeah, I don't know, I don't know how that's gonna go. It sounds really good though. It's exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, I might do a little DIY video. Yeah, there's three of us, so. Oh great! Well, that's yeah, three times <laughs> easier than the last one then. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> And that one might work well with the old um, shabby chic sort of amateur performance. It's a little bit lo fi, do you know what I mean? Right, right. A little bit rough around the edges. So, yeah, good work. Cool. Yeah, it's exciting. And you said you've got a lot of gigs lined up. Um, yeah, I've got, um, well, I've just done two this week, which hasn't happened in a while. Um, and then I've got um, oh, two. Two next month, um, and then oh yeah, and then not 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 one till October then. Uh, and they're all just DJing. Um, the one in October should be really good at the Eagle in Salford. So they oh, yeah. really good parties there. That little room is so good for a party. Um, so yeah, that should be that should be a proper party that one. Um. So yeah, got a little bit, and then hopefully might get out and do something with with the with the guys I've been collabing with. So yeah, things are picking up again, and it's really busy, you know. Do you find that you get to DJ your own way, or do they want you to just play the well-known songs? Yeah, it depends on the gig. Um, 
so that one in October, that's just, you know, house music all night long. So that's that's my love of DJing, do you know what I mean? Um, the other stuff I will do if somebody wants it, you know, if the price is right, sort of thing. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't, you know, if someone asked me to DJ at a night, I wouldn't go with my, my R&B records, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, I do. So I did one last week. Well, the one, of, the first one of the two, um, that was like R and B, and then sort of fed it into a bit of house. It was a little bit more commercial sounding, yeah. yeah. Just to just try and generate a bit of income into music for me, and then the other one was like uh, supporting uh, these like really cool electronic artists, at Thirty Three Alden Street. Oh yeah, um, and that one upstairs yeah. and yeah, yeah yeah, and that one yeah just just to try and sort of warm the crowd up a bit yeah, um, and that yeah just playing playing what I wanted with that one just good house vibes that's cool yeah, so that's where my love is for it. Do um, you find when you're doing the more commercial nights, do you try and slip in your own stuff and go that last one was me? Yeah oh right <laughs> um, do you know what I don't I don't. Um, if you love that last one, check me out. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult with DJing because no one knows who you are. And mm. if I did play one of my own songs, it might be nice to see the reception of it. Yeah, but I've never, no, I've never done it. I've never done it. Um, but yeah, when I say commercial, I've got this real gripe, and I'd probably get over it because I can't like I can't play a song that I don't like. Mm. A lot of DJs can and do. And have to because there's some shite out there, <laughs> uh, but I just can't, you know. And I, and I don't, I don't think it's ego. People, people have been saying, oh, you need to get over yourself. You know what I mean? It's a hard thing to stand there and look like you're enjoying it. That's the thing. I do it because I enjoy it, and I don't. I'm mm. not going to do it because you want me to play David Getter. Do you know what I mean? That's not. <laughs> that's not. I'm not, not going to happen. I think you mentioned David Getter on a previous post, haven't you, on Instagram? Was, I did. I yeah. did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was that? Yeah. It was. It was. Don't ask me to play David Getter. <laughs> it was. I did say those words. Yeah. I don't like him. I don't like the guy. I don't reason. know about the guy. I don't know him. It's not a personal beef. No, I don't know anything about him. Um, enough to form, uh, you know, any sort of uh, a verdict on his stance as a, as a human being but musically no even I saw this video of him DJing and he hasn't even got both decks on he's got one, one I, I think he either had a CD it was about 10 years ago this video mm. he had one CD in it or one USB and he had that playing so it was a pre mixed set and he's just there going yeah so it's the musical equivalent of lip syncing yeah it is it was the DJ equivalent of lip syncing I should say. yeah 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 um, yeah absolutely and it's a shame but you know how much mixing can you do when you've got your hands in your air every 10 minutes jumping on is the that why they do it is it is it so you can be more hyper on the stage without sacrificing the, I think so the mixing quality because all these all these sort of new EDM DJs like your Martin Garrix and stuff like that mm. and uh, yeah those sort of um EDM guys they are jumping around a hell of a lot mm. you know what I mean it's, they're trying to put on a show but they, they don't need to do you know what I mean mm. I think I think keep keep the art form mm. organic and true sometimes just watching the DJ locked into the equipment in front of them or yeah. you know, the same as watching like a pianist playing yeah just you know the fact that they're forgetting about the audience and they're just so into what they're doing that you feel yeah. like they'd be doing it even if you weren't watching that's that can be hypnotic in itself. Yeah, definitely. And with that, you know, you've got the 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 opportunity to change the vibe, or go in a different avenue with it, or just do things to keep it interesting for you. Like as a DJ, why where's your where's your enjoyment of of you know? Mm. You're just out there to gloat in the masses. Do you know what I mean? Mm. In, in front of all these people, go mad. What something you're doing mm. or did. Do you know what I mean? But you just go. You just might as well have a big mirror out there and just look at yourself. 
and just jump around do you know what I mean for all <laughs> he's doing for his ego yeah it's just it's just horrendous um, that is the only purpose to it really do you know what I mean because if like I was one of the reasons that I did have for that was maybe maybe they just want to be you know dead sure they're going to do a good set mm. but why are you one of the most famous DJs in the world if you're if you're yeah. doubting you're going to not do a good set and part of the point of a live performance is the risk yeah you don't go to watch a band for example just to hear them pretend to play their instruments you go for a little bit of chaos and yeah bit yeah of, yeah you know or just to be sort of just reinvigorate that idea that wow mm. they're such a good band do you know what I mean yeah because on the record it might be like oh well yeah you know sounds great yeah they had all day to get it right everything does on a record do you know what I mean but yeah when you see a band and, and you yeah it just just brings in that other, other element doesn't mm. it of enjoyment and yeah so I don't know I saw one video what's his name what's that guy with like long hair I don't even know I just but he he, he got he got he got cream on a plate and started throwing it at the crowd do you know what I mean like mid set what are you doing man why are you not a clown well you are you are a clown <laughs> actually I just like I don't know gone too far haven't we you think it's gimmicks it's that, over substance but I think it says a lot about the crowd as well they're not really bothered mm. do you know what I mean so why are they why are the DJs bothered if you're going to see David Guetta you, you know there might be some people that are really real musos that do happen to like David Guetta but you know say you go to a sort of basement house night the people there are passionate about house music do you know what I mean so they want to see the DJ be a freaking DJ mm. um, so yeah maybe I don't know but yeah no 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 qualms with David Guetta as a as a as a human being I'm sure he's done some lovely things for his mother <laughs> <laughs> You're just not a fan musically. No. 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 I wonder if we'll ever see this. I hope so. <laughs> I'm because I'm sure he's capable of making really good music. Yeah. yeah. I was more of a disappointment, I'm, like not not reaching his potential. Yeah, well, I mean it depends how you define success though, isn't it? I mean he's gonna be you know, I had to I had to run here. Because I couldn't, couldn't get a you know, taxi, so, but he's probably got a limo, uh, which is waiting for him anyway, so, he's probably alright man, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, I hope you reach similar levels on your own terms. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you do it for. Uh, oh, don't get me wrong, man. If um, if someone offered me five hundred thousand pounds to play uh, Tomorrowland, probably do it. Like, <laughs> you know, but um, but you wouldn't be sticking a USB in and calling it a day. Not at all. Not at all. No, it's given up. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't, maybe he's just too busy. Maybe <laughs> get someone else to 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 put a mix together for him. Could be that. Could be like he's trying to give an opportunity. Uh, he knows he knows he can do the gig. He's gonna find a little underground DJ, do him a mix. He's like, hey man. No, nah, he's not. He's not from. He's not from. Uh, where was that? I don't know what accent that was. He's French. <laughs> he does a French accent. Uh, but he probably he might have been like you know hey um, yeah do you fancy doing a set? You won't be playing live. But you'd be playing. You know what I mean? It's like a ghostwriter almost. Yeah. Maybe. Probably not. You and I will know that you contributed to this, but no one else has to know. It was actually me. <laughs> Dave Gator asked me. This is all publicity. But those people who, you know, they've written some of Elton John's best songs and people you've never heard of. Yeah. I think he, I think Elton John in particular has got a, a writing partner, but there's... there's yeah, a, he did, yeah. Um, a regular writing partner. Partner. Yeah, a lot of people were Fred again. He was um he's written a lot of hits for like Adele and stuff and Yeah. I think he did one for like Taylor Swift and real like big pop pop tracks. Um but yeah, and then he's just come out and took over the electronic scene pretty well. Um so yeah, it's a big game, you know, cuz and then it it boils down to the 
the fact again of what's important as an artist, you know, is but for a label, for, for a big major label, it's you know how do you look, how do you come across bankability? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but you know, because they should got they should have got the guy that wrote the song because there's the real artist. Do you mm. know what I mean? Support music properly, but no, just put a poster instead. Yeah. Yeah, it's strange, but it's business, isn't it? It's nice to see that in 2023, there's people like yourself who are working hard on the songs, layering them up, mixing them. Okay, not mastering them, but as we said, that's a... But I can. You can not, do. Not as well. Yeah. <laughs> but you can design the set, write yeah, the man. music video, edit the video together, put it out there, and people tune in, people watch it, people yeah. like it. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, thank that's a positive. You. Yeah, definitely. That's really nice here. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a thousand other people doing it as well, and it feels like maybe that's where we've come to as well. Because maybe if I was trying to become an artist in 1970s or the 80s or whatever, in the old days, um, you know, I might have got picked up and tried by a by a label. And they might have funded all that and got a team and done things properly. But now, labels don't don't have the same... So, well, they, there's more money in the music industry now than ever, but they don't, um, they don't, they don't throw it the same at, art, as art, at artists, do they? Um, so, yeah, you're sort of forced to sort of try and do it as much as you can on your own, aren't you? you just got to try and take joy in it, though. Yeah, but you know what? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm, I like it like that. Yeah. I've always liked having, you know, the option or the opportunity to to do all those other, other aspects of it, like make the artwork for it. And I'm not an artist, you know, I'm not a, like a painter or I don't, I don't draw very well. Um, but I like to have a bash at creating some artwork just to like, you know, mess around with photos or making collages or, you know, just, yeah, just having a play. Um, find that really really enjoyable the whole the whole shebang. and you know that the at the end of the day the final product for better or worse will be at least it will at least be you yeah it's true it's true to me and I feel like it really it really means something you know yeah because uh, if I had have been put into a studio given some songs they record it you know they do the artwork tell me what to wear Don't know if I'd be quite all right with that. I don't I don't I don't know. Depends how much to pay you. Do you know what I mean? That's it, isn't it? That is the biggie. If someone's got a million pound and they say, "Hey, you just sing into that mic." Yeah. You know, all your problems would be solved. Well, yeah, but then how many? Uh, you know, it seems with fame and success, there is definitely a dark side, isn't there? Yeah, that's the dark side. <laughs> I think that's the perfect note to end on. It's the ghost. The ghost will come and haunt you. And it's got us. <laughs> ah, I thought I was getting It's warning me. It's, that was a warning. <laughs> wow. It's the music industry literally sending us a sign. Wow. That's the devil, man. He's here. Oh. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I think we should be. Yeah, that's fine. They've suffered much worse abuse than that, these microphones. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful condensers, but... Yeah. They're not the most sensitive. That like ribbons and stuff, isn't it? So do you work in a studio? Yeah. Um, no, I tend to invade other studios. Okay. It's kind of like what we've done today. Yeah. Because what's the page? The studio in Liverpool? Um, when I was living over in Liverpool... Um, I would kind of be like bedroom producer sort of thing. Mm. Um, what I'm doing now, I'm hoping to work with more artists has come to places like this because yeah. they've got a mixing booth or whatever you want to call it just down the hall there. Yeah. So mm, looking to start collaborating a little bit more, mixing right. more and then the podcast is just like networking slash therapy. 
yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that which kind of goes hand in hand you know I'm in, in the studio all day anyway with microphones kicking around yeah may as well set them up and yeah. talk yeah nice what sort of music is it you make um, ever changing to be honest I, I started off in rock and I still like rock you know I, I'm never going to stop enjoying the sound of big, big guitars yeah. but I'm starting to get more and more interested in electronic, electronic music as I get older as yeah, well. yeah. like I'm sort of appreciating it more as an art form and seeing how much you know for example those reels that you put out seeing how much more work is involved in it than I originally thought and yeah it's interesting to see how creative it, you can be with it and you yeah. know, how you can manipulate sounds as you were saying yeah man and in some respects I put this kind of yeah there 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 <laughs> but you don't breathe on it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't fall. Yeah, I'll try not to breathe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in some respects, you know, electronic music, even though structurally, in terms of the arrangement, you know, with the sections, they are they can be simpler mm. um, than a rock or pop song. But the difficulty with electronic music is you've got to find the means to keep that interesting. Mm. Whereas with a, uh, a pop or rock song, you can have a verse, chorus, bridge. Yeah. Follow a relatively sort of structured format. Obviously, you can. There's fluctuations with that, but on the whole, you can do things. You know, on the quick to make it spice things up. You know. Yeah. Um, but with electronic music, you're limited a bit more. You know. Although obviously, yeah. There's 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 obviously um, different different ways to go about it, but yeah, on the whole, it's it it can be can be more difficult it takes more discipline as well because you yeah. can create unlimited numbers of tracks you can have unlimited number of percussion or yeah. you know backing whatever. yeah and to say no I don't need those ones I do need those ones it's, yeah that's a, that's a real skill that's whereas a, if you were just recording on a four track back in the 80s as a band yeah yeah <laughs> that's a that's the that's a new concept to me isn't it? Uh, less is more mm. you know because I always used to just try and make things sound as big as possible mm. Um, by just layering up you know I'd have like 150 tracks on a project man yeah that's big do you know what I mean you don't need that mm. it's just gonna get muddy um, so yeah just try and scale it back think what's important what's necessary um, without keeping it you know without making it boring really you gotta so, think about where the audience's attention is gonna be focused and you've gotta keep them on that yeah can't be chaotic I don't know maybe sometimes chaos yeah, is good uh, yeah yeah, it can certainly devolve into chaos, you know. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. The um, I think the skill is keeping the listener hooked without. Yeah. Confusing. Them. Yeah, but. but don't be right, predictable. Always right for yourself as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, it's just yeah, mind games. Never right for the audience. No, that's true. But when it comes down to an arrangement. You gotta think how that is translated live. Do you know mm. what I mean? So it just contradicts itself a lot because if you never thought about the audience, I'm sure music would sound a lot different. Do mm. you know what I mean? There'd be a lot less cookie cutter, three mm. minute catchy. Definitely. But I love that. You know, I love, I love, I love that sort of the early pop music like the Beatles and yeah. the '60s stuff. Um. Some of the stuff now is good, you know. There's there's good music out there. But yeah, but on the whole, I don't really listen to a lot of pop. Just tends to be, just tends to sound too clean and polished and 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 you know nice and mm. that's a bit raw, you know. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, I'll urge people to go and check out Monge Two's. Is it three singles you put out so far? Well, yeah, but I did put a fourth out, but then that's the one that got. So picked up by a label, right? And they want to re-release it. So it's been remastered. Oh, cool! And it's being released on a on a compilation series that the the label put out every oh, year. Cool. So it's called Edgy Future Disco Tech. I think this is going to be volume four. Okay, I think could be something like that. Maybe four. Okay. Maybe five. Maybe five. Or three. 
<laughs> one of them. But either way, your track's going to be on it. It is. It is. Cool. Looking it forward is. to hearing it. Yeah. Um, it's called Body Vibrations. Cool. It's really cool. Great. It was like, yeah, I, I was pretty happy with that one, so. Yeah. Hope you enjoy it. And thanks for doing this. Hey, thanks for having me, man. It's been fun. But, yeah, it's been a bit of a pleasure. I man. feel cleansed. Yeah, no, it's really nice being here. The Other Side Podcast. Hosted by John Stone. New episodes every week.